So hello, everybody. I hope the mic works, and I hope I maneuver it properly. And today I will talk about shortcuts to better dApp development. But it's not top five GPT prompts that you can use to speed it up. Um, it, it'll be less corner cutting. And we'll go into uh, the, a discussion even about where do we see the problems that make dApp development slow and hard, and how can we speed it up? In other words, where do we actually need innovation in, in this space? So let's start with, the, with, I think this is an obvious thing, Web3 development is hard. So raise of hands, how many of us agrees? Web3 dev is hard, I think like 60% at least raise their hands, thank you so much. Uh, on the other hand, Web3 development is fun. Raise of hands. Well. Pretty much similar number, come on, it's fun. <clears throat> and let's, let's dig in uh, to how can we build shortcuts that enable us to actually have more of the fun part and less of the hard part. Uh, before I start talking about this, I'll just uh, ask you to think about what, it may, what is it that uh, makes Web3 development a hard thing? Because I would like to get your input during the, the presentation. So let's make this a little more interactive. When it comes to building shortcuts to better dApp development, we can either, we can approach it from, from two angles. The first one is to uh, build tools and make the development such that interoperability and integration is, becomes easier on every level. And another thing is better development workflow with more cohesiveness and less friction along the way. So these are the two angles that I'm going to address now through various, various uh, examples. But before we do that, let me just tell you a little bit about Tenderly. So Tenderly is the company I'm coming from, and we're building tools, infrastructure, and services that help Web3 developers move faster, develop uh, in a more sustainable way, and yeah, just keep your peace of mind. So when we talk about the tools, for the five years that we've been in the Web3 uh, arena, we built a visual debugger, which gives you a call-by-call -call, uh, way to go through your transactions and figure out why they failed. A gas profiler that allows you to see how much gas your contracts use so you can optimize them. And the third thing is the simulation UI that, allow, that gives you like an IDE-like uh, experience when debugging your contracts, when optimizing gas, when figuring out how can you do better transactions. The next thing that we're focusing on in is infrastructure. And in that arena, we've developed two technologies called DevNets and Forks, which are pretty much uh, managed forks of uh, 30 ish networks that we're supporting in Tenderly. So that means that you don't have to spin up a fork on your local machine. You can spin it up on our infrastructure and it's available through, through uh, the cloud to yourself and your team. And the last bit of infrastructure is the Web3 gateway, which is node as a service that comes along and fills, uh, makes this picture complete. Now, when it comes to services, okay, we have our tooling, we have our infrastructure, but there are other things that we also need to do, and that's on the, for the beginning, an API that allows you to simulate transactions from your uh, dApps, from your uh, UIs, but also from your backends. The second thing is alerting. So you need to be very much aware what's happening to your contracts as they're live and used on the network. For example, something big and important is going on, good or bad, and you want to know about it as soon as it's happening. And the third bit is Web3 Actions. And you can think of Web3 Actions as alerts that do something, that react when something happens on chain. And this is just a quick rundown of all of the things that, that we built. And the cool thing is that all of this is available on 30-ish uh, networks that, that we support and we keep integrating. But let's get back to the topic. Uh, from talking to various teams in the space uh, who are using our technology, we, well, understood uh, the same thing we agreed on, that Web3 is difficult, and the first thing is it's got a very steep learning curve. And the second reason why it's difficult, it's got an 
even, an even steeper patience curve. That means there's a high sense of urgency that we need different tools and better tools, but there's so much going on that it's simply very hard to get there. So let's, pack, let's unpack what difficult is. And one definition could be it's a presence of, of obstacles that need to be surmounted or puzzles that we need to resolve. And obstacles come in very di various levels and shapes and sizes. And for example, team collaboration is not something that's super easy when you're doing Web3. CI is sort of not that common and not that easy and not that resolved in this space. There's this first set of tools that you have to use. Uh, there's very um, troublesome support for, for reusing the stuff you're building. So these are just some, some things that we spotted talking to, to different teams. And now I would like to ask you to come back to the question, what makes Web3 difficult for you? So think about it in terms of just three or four keywords. Uh, why is Web3 difficult or hard for you? And now you can see this little QR code, and I hope you can see it properly. And I would like you to scan it. It'll open up um, a website where you can enter those three keywords. Let's see what are the feelings, what are the things that make Web3 development hard. And let's take 30 seconds for everybody to wrap their hands, heads around the question. So I think the audience has given you, you can keep on adding to this and I'll share, I'll share this on, on Twitter after the presentation is over. But we can see that the biggest topics that arise are security testing, debugging, tooling, interoperability, gas, optimization, debug, that kind of things. And of course, there, there are other topics that we need to address as a space as well, but these are sort of the most prominent ones coming from, from this crowd. And one thing that uh, I would like to talk to you about first uh, is actually about this word over here, interoperability. And to get interoperability, we need integration, so to make things integrate more easily. So let me get back to, to the PowerPoint. Okay, thank you for participation. We'll, we'll do another one uh, soon. So let's talk about innovation and integration. So we have different protocols, we have different projects, and usually those projects and protocols want to integrate with each other. And the way to, to do that, well, we need to have easier interoperability. Now to get to interoperability, well, we need easier integrations. We need components that can be composed in an easier way. So the, the, the entire composability of blockchain doesn't uh, remain as hard as it is. And to get there, we need higher abstractions. So we need to take, and, uh, we need to take simpler operations, the lower primitives, and pack them into something that's high, high, on a higher level of abstraction so we can combine them together. And one take, 
that we had to this topic is something that we call node extensions. So yeah, here's the, the sense of urgency to get there. And uh, what we built is node extensions. So we've taken the node, and this is a symbol for Tenderly's gateway, which is a node as a service thing. And the idea was, OK, how can we make protocols and projects integrate more easily? Well, one sensical place to do that is actually to extend the JSON RPC interface. It's very simple. It's open to extension. So why wouldn't we move all the complexity and all the abstraction behind the JSON RPC interface? Now, to do that, we need to take the node and extend it with some functionality. So node extensions. And it works in the following way. So on this side, we have our Ethereum network, EVM compatible network. And in front of it, talking to it, reading from it, and writing to it, is Tenderly's Web3 gateway. And it, of course, offers the regular operations you would see uh, in a JSON RPC interface. But what we did is that we're allowing you to actually build your own custom JSON RPCs that can do things, that can move uh, data, we can consider that a simple operation, and you can bundle it into one uh, higher level uh, JSON RPC method. So you can imagine a UI builder just using this one JSON RPC, giving inputs to it and getting results back, or you can imagine your backend doing that in a similar way. And what this does, you don't put the burden of I have to integrate yet another API to your uh, DAP UI builder or to somebody working on backend. It's simply using the node, and it can simply just call this method and get the response back. So we're sort of putting extra functionality on the node instead of having tens, dif tens of different services that you have to integrate with. And now, let's see just a little demo. Um, so before, before I, this is a video and I'm going to play it. One cool thing about this is that besides allowing you to create your own node extensions, we also have a library. And what this means, you can take your node extension, pack it, and put it onto a GitHub repo, and it becomes available for other projects. So this opens the door for other projects to integrate with your uh, system. And I guess it's pretty easy to see that, yeah, there's an activate and deactivate button, and we'll just see how, it, how, it, how you would create a node extension from scratch. Oops. So I didn't expect this to happen. So the first thing we can notice is that there's a prefix extension, so that means it's a custom JSON RPC endpoint you're just adding now, and we're going to give it a name. And now, now, what, now what happens is that we need a place to add some code to the extension. So by uh, choosing this action dropdown, you get a little uh, space where you can actually input some JavaScript code. And from this, we can see that, okay, there's an event coming into the node extension, and there's something that's doing the processing. So from the looks of it, this node extension is like uh, the bash echo command. It, it gets an argument, it just spits it out. So whatever gets in, it goes out. And let me play the rest of the video. I'm not going to stop it. So this created and activated the test extension. And you can try it out, or you can just call it through the JSON RPC interface. And this is an example. So uh, we're typing in uh, 12345. And when we send request, because this is an echo, you get the, the arguments back. So you can imagine doing more complex thing with things within the node extension itself. Uh, we just built uh, an echo node extension. All right, so that's one thing. But let's come back to the topic of what are the other reasons Web3 development is hard. Well, we have to iterate, because we can't nail things on the first go. We're bug-driven. We're, we're error-driven uh, when it comes to development. 
And um, there, we also need to move fast, which is something that doesn't just come out of the box. And when we iterate, we can think of or we can think of it as we iterate on a daily level, so developing contracts, developing UI, stuff like that, but also on a higher level when we're adding different layers to the product, adding uh, different facets to the product. So when it comes to daily iterations, some of the, the issues that were present in the word cloud, it, well, it's bugs, it's gas usage, and a difficulty is I had to choose this one, building a UI and building it in a nice way, nice to the person building the UI. So thinking about the team a little bit. And let's go over a bit of these tools. So when it comes to debugging and optimizing gas, one approach we have is, well, of course, the Tenderly debugger. It, it, it's a visual debugger that's available in the cloud, gas profiler, and um, simulation UI. And we'll do a very, very quick demo of this and what it offers. But before that, I would just like to reflect on how we approached building this thing way back. So before we were able to get the transaction information from the EVM, um, the Tenderly team actually took a different approach. We put a lot of probes into the EVM. So when you run a transaction, whether it succeeds or fails, you get a whole lot of data that you can show to, the, to a developer so they can understand how the transaction executed, where it failed, why it failed, and so on. The gas profiler simply gives you the exact gas usage, thanks to those probes, and the simulation UI gives you a chance to um, verify your bug fixes by not sending a simulation to the network, but running it in a virtual environment, in a simulated environment. And that's why it's so fast, and uh, that's why it helps people move, move faster. So now, this is going to be tricky to do a demo like this. <clears throat> All right, so I'm in the simulator now. And here you can see that we can actually adjust all the input parameters which are readable in a pretty humanly readable form. But also what we can do is when we're debugging and we found an issue with the code, we can simply go edit source code and wait a bit for the source to load. And you can actually modify any piece of this source, which I'm not going to do now because this is not a position to do it. So when you apply your bug fix, you can simply go and simulate the transaction. So what it does, it replays the entire transaction with adjusted input parameters or with adjusted source code. So I'll hit simulate, and then this is the time it takes. OK, so it's not as fast as I hoped it to be. This is the time it took it to simulate the whole thing, to display the entire call trace, which can be pretty lengthy. And this one actually succeeded, so that's cool. But what, also, what you also get here is decoded events, so you can understand what was emitted, the, uh, the state changes, and also the gas profiler, which gives you a very in-depth overview of how much gas your transaction used as it executed. And you can even pinpoint a suspicious method and jump back into debugger and try to understand how you can optimize this further. So this is how, uh, how the simulator can give you a chance to uh, fix bugs. But another cool thing is when you're preparing a transaction you want to send to a network. You can prepare it in the simulator, so you can play around with the input parameters uh, and, and stuff like that. So when it's actually ready, you can use this raw input and just send this as a transaction to, to the actual network. So you can play around in the simulator as much as you want, and when you feel it's ready, you can go out and actually send the real thing to the network. So that was the hardest demo I ever did because <laughs> of this, this screen. And let me get back into the slides. So th this is one sort of shortcut that you can take to make you move, move faster. And the second thing that I want to talk about is UI building. And you can imagine somebody building a UI and they want to change the UI really rapidly because the, the, the frameworks we use for the UIs allow you to do that. But 
the network is low or they have they struggle setting everything up so the devnets or forks uh, are here as an as a logical uh, shortcut uh, what you would do is you would fork a network in tenderly so that's a network of simulated transactions and just give the JSON RPC to, to this person over there so they can make changes really fast, they can see transaction outcomes really fast and they don't have to set up anything on their local machine. Bonus points because whatever they do, if a transaction fails, they can easily share transactions with the team so you can understand why your smart contracts behave in, in, a, in an inappropriate way. And this is a little demo, again, a little video of creating a DevNet. So you would go there, create a template from a network, and just name that DevNet, save it. And this is your blueprint for all the future instances of the network. So you can have this as a starting point, and whenever you spawn a network, you get a new JSON RPC link, so you can always come back to the same place in the network's history, and, for example, add it to your hardhead project, um, so when you, uh, when you deploy contracts or you interact with them uh, using uh, the hardcast scripts, uh, it all actually happens on the DevNet. So here we're deploying and interacting a couple of contracts. Uh, and you can see that these transactions happen instantly. And what's the best part is this is visible to your entire team and you can easily jump into debugging and have that collaboration uh, channel more clear and and more fluent. Of course, you get a like a very private transaction explorer. This is visible to you only with all of these beautiful things that that we saw before, and you can also see the overview of all the JSON RPC calls that were made uh, with with this script. So, that's that's about DevNets. Now, on a wider scale, where do we iterate? Well, there's the security aspect, and this is a pain point for, for many of us. Uh, there's automation, and there's QA testing. So let's talk about security. And one, we have to approach this problem through different, different angles. One angle is to do audits, lots of them, of course. But again, when your contracts are live, you probably want to see when the invariants of the contracts are broken, or if somebody is calling some methods that seem fishy. And for that purpose, you can use alerts to set up a security harness around your smart contracts so you can get notifications as soon as something fishy is going on. Now, for automations, the Web3 actions are there. Web3 actions listen to whatever's happening to your contracts, and they execute a little piece of JavaScript uh, in response to those events. So you can pull in some data from the network, bundle it together, aggregate it, make it humanly readable, and send that information to somebody, in, to, to your community even. Okay, and QA seems pretty, pretty uh, logical. So you would deploy your DAP on a fork or on the DevNet, and people who want to try out your, your DAP or do some sort of quality testing or security testing, well, they can go about it and they can drill the app um, for as long as they want. And it's fast because there's no network latency when using uh, DevNets. And we have 10 minutes left. In these 10 minutes, I would like to invite you To another question. Uh, let me just hop in here. Okay. So I'd like to invite you what are your best practices, problems, and solutions? So the problems you stumbled upon and the approaches to it, whether you actually managed to solve it fully or actually just attempted solving it. So let's take a minute or two. You can, you can keep adding these as we go on, but we could also start a live Q&A, so if you have any questions, raise your hand, a mic will be uh, at your site. Yeah, we have a question. So, so I think like one, one big practice that a lot of uh, contracts don't do is uh, uh, after it's deployed, the uh, alerting and monitoring, uh, you know, monitoring key uh, states of the, uh, the contract, 
and also kind of alerting the developer if you know certain or even just basic things like exceptions or you yeah. know uh, certain things happen or certain things exceed certain threshold, then the developers can catch the issue before the user before it's wide scale and peop, uh, users actually notice it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, allow users noticing it. Uh, so like in in Web two, there are like services that do that. You know, that even hook up with uh, uh, you know on call engineers. You know, when when there are alerts that happen. I don't know if it's covered in one of your services, uh, alerting and monitoring of, of uh, smart contracts. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. So um, if, if I understood correctly, you're saying that uh, we should actually, when we deploy the contracts, monitor for everything good and bad that's going on with them? Yes, like, like uh, metrics All right. uh, about, you know, like, you know, if it's peop if anything to do with money, for example, you know, like, if someone keeps withdrawing, you know, like you know, a certain threshold, maybe it's not yeah. even, even an issue, but it, it's like, you know, how like banks, if you withdraw too much, maybe yeah. they they think it's suspicious. You know, just like alerts that uh, the team can then possibly act on. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in in my view, that's responsibility of the development team to figure out what are the suspicious patterns that th we should be aware of, right? Right, in real time. Yeah. In real time. Yeah. So setting up alerts around those suspicious patterns, for example, this view function changed value for 15% from, yeah. from the last time, or yeah, the, right. this amount of withdrawal happened uh, in the previous window of time, or something like that. Right. So setting up alerts around those is possible with Tenderly, and forwarding them to PagerDuty or Sentry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a way to connect those tools we're familiar with, PagerDuty and Sentry, with the world of blockchain if you set up alerts that simply give signals to those tools. So your team is very, very much aware when something is and happening. And does, uh, does your tool, I think you had a page on the services, do they send to Sentry? Like, does your tool integrate with those, those tools? It yeah, just, so, so our yeah. alerts can integrate with, with those. Okay, with great. With Sentry and PagerDuty. It's, uh, well, I didn't explain this, but alerts can send messages to Discord, Slack, blah, 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 and also to Sentry and PagerDuty. So this can, this can create the full sort of experience of, okay. of monitoring there. Okay, and it can also uh, pass data, like those key metrics, uh, so that I, I forgot the, the you know, popular yeah. tool for that, the name of that, but you can have a dashboard of yeah, yeah, yeah. the key metrics. Yeah. So, so I think that. At this stage, it's just giving signals, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. So the metrics and making sense out of that, that's something that's still on the side of the development team. But this is a very good in, uh, example of where we can uh, innovate and we, where we can create more, more tools. For, this is a use case for that, mm -hmm. I believe. Thank you for the question. Cool. Other questions? Yeah, um, is there a difference between the DevNet and uh, Fork? I didn't c quite catch the difference. Sorry? The difference between a DevNet and a Fork. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference? All right, so there is a difference. DevNet uh, Forks are actually very, very simple chains of simulated transactions. So an entire simulated network. Fork, uh, th those are forks. And DevNets take it a level up. So you can think of a DevNet as a Docker container, uh, as a Docker file for forks. So you can practically set up your CI with the configuration of a DevNet, and each time you have a build, it spins up a new DevNet with a fresh new simulated network that you can use. So we made that part easier with that. Thanks for the question. All right. So can let's, we share the results? Yeah, let's please? let's see the results. Um, study hard. <laughs> Albert <laughs> handsome <laughs> boy. <laughs> what? DevOps integrate foundry testing coverage reports better get branch design that make sure we move fast but got enough review from security experts before merging into other works work streams. So this is a very much uh, the the development process plus 